Welcome to today's Data Talk, Institutional Investors' Impact on the Housing Market. And thank you both for joining us, both in person and those tuning into the webcast. Uh, my name is Lori Goodman, and I'm the co-head of the Housing Finance Policy Center here at Urban. Today's Data Talk focuses on the impact of single-family institutional investors in the aftermath of the financial crisis, as well as an update as to what is happening today. Institutional investor contributions um, are quantified, in, bo in both of our um, paper presentations, are quantified using property records data. I want to thank Mark Fleming from First American for encouraging us to have this series series of data talks that focuses on successfully using property records data, as so many of us are in the early stages of employing that data. We want to welcome back Lauren Lambie Hansen, an advisor and research fellow at the Federal Reserve Bank of Philadelphia, and now a regular contributor to our data talk series. Um, George Auerbach, managing director and head of research at Predium Partners, and Rohan Gandhari, an assistant professor of finance at the Gazoida Business School at Emory University. You can find Find out more information about them and, the, and their research in your speaker biography handouts. Um, there's a packet um, of speaker biographies, and there's also a set of slides um, just outside. So if you fail to pick it up on your way in, please do. Um, Lauren will show that institutional investors contributed to reduced vacancy rates, increased real home price appreciation, and the decline in home ownership between 2006 and 2014. Rohan will discuss how institutional investors' bulk purchases of distressed properties help local housing markets recover because properties near bulk uh, sold properties sold better than those located further away from such properties. And George Auerbach will discuss both papers and also provide his perspective on the role of, instit of institutional investors in the single family rental market. We'll then transition over to a question and answer session during the last 15 to 20 minutes of this talk. Throughout the program, webcast guests are welcome to submit their questions to events at urban.org. Again, events at urban.org. Please identify yourself by name and affiliation when you submit your questions. Um, materials from today's talk will be posted on urban events page, www.urban.org slash events. And um, with that, give a warm welcome to Lauren. I'd like to mention that our next event is going to be held on January 21st, and it's going to feature Sam Cater, Chief Economist at Freddie Mac. So again, welcome, Lauren. Thank you very much. Hello. Thanks, Lori, for the introduction and for inviting me back to share this work. This is, um, is joint work with Wen Lee Lee and Mike Slonkowski, also of the Philadelphia Fed. And of course, although we work at the Fed, this is our views, not those of the Philadelphia Fed or the Federal Reserve System. Our paper actually looks at several different ways that investors have impacted housing markets in the recovery. But in the interest of time and because this is a data talk, which basically gives me free license to talk about my favorite part of this, which is the data, the public records data, I'm going to focus more on the data, the patterns that we see, and then really just draw out the headline result from our paper, which is about the role of investors in the recovery of house prices. So we began this work several years ago in order to investigate a set of facts that we thought were pretty interesting. Homeownership rates, we know, rose during the, the housing boom and fell significantly during the crisis. And although nationally house prices began recovering in late 2012, early 2013, the homeownership rate continued to fall until mid-2016, which is off the chart that I have for you today. The homeownership rate, for those of you who are interested, ended in 2019 just over 65%, according to the most recent census data available, which for context is where it was in early 1996. So we have not recovered in terms of homeownership still um, to where we were pre-crisis. We know that there were regional differences in how the recovery played out. Peak to trough reductions in house prices were largest in places like Las Vegas, shown here in orange, and the speed of the recovery differed. So did the amount by which homeownership declined. And so what we find in our work is that recovery paths can be largely explained by the presence of investors who captured a larger share of the housing market, specifically, in this case, investors purchasing properties as corporate entities. For the purpose of my presentation today, I'm going to refer to these as institutional investors, but I apologize in advance because I know that Rohan is also going to use that term to mean something different. So I'll let him explain what he means. 
In my case, though, we're looking at the at owners who buy properties through some sort of corporate entity. Some of these investors, but not all, are going to be affiliated with large financial or real estate firms. So I'll give a, a better definition in a few slides. The presence of these buyers has been mostly flat, had been mostly flat since the early, since the early 2000s, but it picked up significantly during the mortgage crisis. The buyers were particularly prominent in markets that had a lot of distressed sales, namely foreclosures, during the crisis. And we find that in counties where these investors bought more single-family homes, county-level house prices recovered faster and vacancy rates fell. Given that a common business model is for investors to rent out properties, including converting some, um, some properties that were previously owner-occupied into rentals, of course it's important to be concerned that there might be negative side effects for renters, for tenants, like increased rent-to-price ratios or greater eviction rates. But we actually don't find any evidence that having more investors causes more of these problems, at least not at the county level during the time period that we're studying, which is an important caveat. But intuitively, having more of these investors in a market is going to mean that fewer homes will be bought by owner occupants, so the home ownership rate falls. If you think about it, though, this isn't a perfect one-to-one -one relationship because there is another group of, of owners that I haven't told you about, right? Small, non-corporate, or individual investors and I'll give some details about them in a moment. So this is a set of maps for MSAs in the Case-Shiller 20-City Composite Index, looking at the change in institutional or corporate investor purchases between 2000 and 2012. Blue means growth in investor activity, red means fewer investors, and this is mapped at the zip code level. What you can see is that most zip codes in these 20 MSAs had growth in investors during this time period, but there's a lot of heterogeneity both between and within metro areas. And we know that investors have different business models. So two common models are buy to rent and flipping. In either of these models, the investor may or may not make improvements to the property. And that's notoriously difficult for researchers to figure out on the kinds of data that are available to us, unfortunately. With buy to rent, the ultimate intention may be to one day sell the property once the market improves, but the investor might choose to rent it out in the meantime. Case study research by the Harvard Joint Center for Housing Studies during the mortgage crisis found that investors' business models were different across MSAs and that the type of investors who were active in different cities were different, just like the scale of those investors and where they were located. Another finding from that line of research is that some investors have to be flexible with their business model and react to how the market is performing. Um, specifically, they may buy and renovate a particular property with the intention to flip it, but if they can't sell it at the price that they want or need, they may decide to rent it out in the meantime while they wait for the market to improve. So, so investors might end up taking a property by property um, approach to investment. But large investors may be better positioned to commit to a particular strategy, whether that's going to be flipping or holding properties as rentals. Whether we're talking about large institutions or small corporate entities, investors do have competitive advantages in the real estate market. A great paper by Raven Malloy and co-authors explains that investors aren't as sensitive to, as others to financing constraints, specifically um, contractions in the availability of mortgage credit. They also have better institutional knowledge, and those who manage a large number of properties have, have um, potentially been able to benefit from new technology that helps them realize scale economies. And it's also really important to point out that our paper is studying the housing recovery. And during this time, a lot of the properties purchased by investors were coming out of foreclosure. Many of those properties were in serious need of rehabilitation, and investors are often better positioned to take on those kinds of repairs and improvements than are the typical homeowner. George will tell us how that's changed over time. Okay, so on to the data. All right, our analysis is based on property level real estate transactions data from across the US, and our source is CoreLogic. Using this data, we can see the date of each sale names of buyers and sellers, the location of a home, the amount that the property was sold for, whether buyers used a mortgage or bought with cash. We link this data to tax assessor data, also from CoreLogic, to observe the buyer's mailing address. I'll tell you more about that in a moment. One of the key outcome variables in our paper is house price change at the county level. So we use CoreLogic house price 
um, indices at the county level. And we also use Home Mortgage Disclosure Act data and Black Knight McDash data to estimate the number of individual investors using mortgages to buy single family properties in the county. I'll tell you a little more about that. We also make use of a host of other data sets. We use vacancy data from, census, from, from the Postal Service, home ownership rates from Census, unemployment from BLS, various types of rental data from Zillow, and eviction rates from the eviction lab at Princeton. All right, so there's a lot of literature out there about investors using microdata. And there are several commonly accepted methods of how to just identify who is an investor in the types of data sets that these researchers are using. Each of these methods has its drawbacks. Perhaps the most common method is to look at the occupancy type fields in mortgage data coming from servicers or from Humda. This gets you a, only a subset of actual investors, because if you think about it, many investors aren't using mortgages at all to buy homes, so they're not even going to appear in these data sets. And there's also, a, there's also a strong incentive to misreport oneself as an owner occupant to get a cheaper mortgage interest rate. This fraud is more common than you might think, according to research by my colleague, Ronel Alul at the Philadelphia Fed. Another method that's common is to look at the number of mortgages a, cus, a consumer has on her credit report. But this is again tricky if the buyer isn't using a mortgage or at least a mortgage tied to her personal credit. Using public records data, we can sometimes identify flippers looking at, you know, looking at people linking them by name across all the different properties that they purchase and looking to see how, how long they hold the properties or whether they hold lots of properties at the same time. And this works pretty well when you have people with really unusual names like mine, but it doesn't work so well when you have very common um, buyer names. And it also is really tricky given that a lot of investors purchase properties through LLCs both larger and smaller investors do this, right, to shield their other assets. And um, speaking as someone who has done these exercises of linking lots of LLCs to the main, um, the, the main investor, it's, it's very time consuming and int data intensive. All right, so finally, you can compare the address of the property to an owner's mailing address on file with local property tax assessors. This also gets pretty messy, with situations like PO boxes, and again, there's some financial incentive to misreport yourself as an owner occupant, right? So if you're an investor and you live in one of the many jurisdictions in the US that offers a property tax exemption for owner occupants, you might say, yes, please send my tax bill to my residence. I live here when you don't, right? We would not recommend that. <laughs> All right, so we take a hybrid approach to figuring out how many counties in a property are purchased and held by investors. And here specifically institutions, as we're calling them broadly defined business corporate entities. If an individually named human or a pair of humans buy a property, then we say that that's an individual. And otherwise, if it's a business name, we call it an investor, an institutional investor. So if you think about it, business institutions can be can fit into two main groups. We wanted to look at the very large institutions, um, like the ones that Rohan and George will be telling you more about. So we used Amherst's 2017 report to pick out those top 20 institutional investors. And then we separate those out from the smaller, the smaller investors, many of which are more regionally focused in what they do, how they do business, or even very hyper-local. In, in terms of the individuals, you're looking at people who are just homeowners, and also investors who are buying in their own name. This method follows Mills, Molloy, and Zarutsky, what they do in their paper. And like them, of course, we're going to exclude government entities, corporate relocation services, and banks who are buying properties. Because while these aren't individuals, they certainly aren't institutional investors. So unfortunately, the top 20 largest investors don't make it easy on researchers to figure out what properties they buy. They buy properties under lots of different names. And so the method that we adopted was to take kind of a snowball approach to figuring out um, how to combine all the different LLCs into um, what, what are the properties bought by Blackstone. Right. And so what we do is we start with the initial name associated with a firm, so for Blackstone Invitation Homes. And we look to see all the different addresses that tax, that, that tax bills for single family properties held by Blackstone, where are those tax bills being sent? Then we 
see, um, we, we sort of look backwards and say, well, what are all the names that use those addresses, right? So it's sort of a snowball approach at each, and we, we, we keep doing this for three rounds. And every time we get a new buyer name, we do internet searches to make sure that it really isn't affiliated with some other parent company, like this isn't two firms having the same attorney and getting tax bills at the same location. Um, and uh, we va also validate the approach by summing up the number of purchases we get for every major investor um, to what's found in the Amherst report to confirm that we got a pretty reasonable number. Right. So how about those individual investors who are buying in their own names? We know that those are important um, buyers in a lot of communities. So we are mainly focused on business institutions in our paper, and individual investors are much harder to identify in public records data. So, um, so for most of the analysis, I'm excluding them, but I want to show you how big of a role they play. Um, so what we're going to do is we can quantify this group by thinking about the two main ways that they buy homes. They can either use a mortgage or they can pay cash or, or, or have some other type of financing that's not going to be picked up as a lien recorded in uh, local registries. So for those of you who are not familiar with public records data, basically this is pretty raw data that's recorded in local registries or recorders of deeds, usually at the county level, and firms like CoreLogic um, sort of aggregate that data, standardize it, and, um, and, and sell it, right? So this is really when you have any type of transaction where there's a deed involved, any mortgage lien that's placed on a property that's going to be recorded in the local county, that's going to get picked up in a public records data set. All right. So we can estimate the number of buyers in a county who are individual investors um, who are buying single-family homes with a mortgage if we leverage information from Humda and also from McDash. This gets a little bit in the weeds, and I get really excited about it. But in the, in the interest of time, I'll save that for later if anyone wants to talk to me about how that's done, or you can see the paper. We also want to include individual buyers who, who, who purchase using cash. But this is tricky, right, because some homeowners use cash to buy their homes. And so if we include these in a big group of investors, basically we think that this is going to be an upper bound on the number of investors. All right, so what we end up with is a county by year data set looking at um, single family purchases between 2000 and 2014 for the background work we do, but our regression is really focusing on the mortgage crisis and the recovery period, so we're limiting to 2007 to 2014, which is um, conveniently when our data ended at the time we started this project. We've thrown out nominal sales, those with transaction prices below $1,000, relocation sales, sales into bank ownership, so foreclosure deeds where the banks are the purchasers, or transfers of properties between banks, and between banks and GSEs, and between multiple um, other types of entities where it's just clearly like not getting sold to um, an, an, an ultimate purchaser. It's going to use the property. So our data set covers about 600 counties, and that all of these are metropolitan. They come from about 300 distinct MSAs, and our panel data set includes about 5,000 county by year observations. Here are some charts that are going to show you the prevalence of how investors have changed over time. The blue line is our full sample, and we've just picked out a few different MSAs for purpose of illustration, some differences here. So the orange line is Las Vegas MSA, red is Atlanta, San Francisco's in gray, and Cleveland in green. What we can see on top, uh, the top left panel, panel A, is the institutional purchases as a percentage of all sales, so these are all of these corporate buyers, were really flat leading up to the crisis, and they began to um, inch up really almost every year starting in 2007. In panel B, we're going to add those, those individual investors who purchase using a mortgage. And there we see a run-up pre-crisis in most places, which is consistent with the literature um, about the role that these um, smaller investors played in the housing boom. In panel C on the lower left, we add individual buyers who paid cash. And there again, we see a lot of growth starting in 2007, which is consistent with the fact that a lot of the properties on the market were distressed sales and the easiest way to acquire a property out of foreclosure, especially if you're buying at foreclosure auction, is to pay cash. Also, just we know that mortgage credit is much tighter during this time period, and so it's going to be easier to buy if you're paying cash. Okay, so of course, some investors are also selling homes during this time period. So you might think, well, why are you looking at gross purchases, you should really be looking at net purchases. And so in this lower right 
figure, lower right chart, I'm showing a version of, the, of, of figure A, but we just net out the sales each, each year that are done by investors. Um, I think, Lori, questions? It's a clarifying question now. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So okay. So, uh, C, mm -hmm. why does only Y axis add up to 100? So, it's, you've got the institutions, you've got the individual investors and all this, and the cash. So, what's the residual category? From C, so like why is um, Las Vegas starting at like a 25% in 2001? The rest are homeowners. So, so these are only looking at investors, different ways of thinking about investors. So, so the residual category left over from C would be homeowners who purchased with mortgages, right? Or who, who are not observed in public records data to have a mortgage lien at the time that they purchased. Thanks. Okay, so sticking with our main definition of investor activity, looking at those corporate or institutional investors and their, um, their, the, the share of purchases that they made, here are some maps that are showing you over time how um, their activity changed. And we see a lot of growth in these investors, particularly in California, Nevada, the Southeast, um, but also in the Mid-Atlantic and some Midwestern states. In terms of the largest institutional investors, those top 20, we're seeing more activity in the Southeast, but also interestingly in some of the Rust Belt states. And I know George is going to speak um, in considerable detail about this. All right. Our model primarily looks at house price growth, inflation adjusted as a function of the share of homeowners who purchased institu institu that were purchased by institutions, controlling for recent changes in population, and because it's autocorrelated earlier house price changes, unemployment, foreclosure rates, and real household income. All of these indicators are lagged, and we include county and year fixed effects. However, you'd immediately worry that the share of institutional investors purchasing homes in a county is going to be endogenous, right? Because investors, particularly large investors, when they're choosing where to purchase homes, presumably are smart about this, right? They're strategically buying properties and markets they expect to improve. So we'd be worried that a simple OLS regression would result in a biased estimate of the impact of investors on things like local house price change or the multitude of other um, outcomes we look at in our paper like vacancy rates, employment, um, duration that properties are spending in REO. So our identification strategy is to use county's exposure to a program called First Look that was put in place by the GSEs, by Fannie in August 2009 and Freddie in September 2010. So what this program does is once a, once a, once a property secured by a mortgage owned by Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac becomes real estate owned and it's in Fannie and Freddie's portfolio, when they get ready to put it on the market with a broker, they basically give a first look period, a first bite at the apple, so to speak, to, home, to homeowners, nonprofits, and also during the crisis, government entities that were using neighborhood stabilization program or NSP funds to buy properties to purchase, um, to, to basically stabilize um, distressed neighborhoods. Initially, this, pro this period was 15 days. So these groups would have 15 days to put in their bids or their offers for a home. And if it still wasn't sold, then after this time period, the GSEs would open up the property for sale to an investor. The, the period was extended to 20 days in most parts of the US, 30 days in Nevada, and I believe Freddie has um, a couple of counties, additional counties that they do this um, for, for 30 days in. The program is still active today. So using McDash data on single family properties and REO and foreclosure in each county year, we can calculate the exposure of each county to um, this first look program by looking at the percentage of distressed mortgages that are going through the foreclosure process or have entered REO that are held by the GSEs rather than um, by other types of mortgage holders. And what we find in the first stage of our two stage model is that indeed the greater the share of distressed sales that are held by GSEs, the fewer investors are purchasing properties in a, in a county. So it seems like this program was actually pretty effective in um, getting and channeling more properties to homeowners. Okay, you might worry that maybe this is just um, has some spurious correlation and it's, it's violating the instrumental variables exclusion restriction, that maybe there's some other reason why um, low GSE means more investors, like, um, like uh, that, that, that they're just attracted to places where there was more of a subprime boom. 
So we um, include county fixed effects in our regression model. So basically this is within county variation, which we think helps address that concern. Here are the results from the main model. As a reminder, the outcome variable is annual real house price growth. So what we can see is the one percentage point increase in institutional buyers um, is um, basically seems to cause a nearly 63 basis point increase in the annual house price growth rate. How much is a 63 basis point increase in house prices? If you think about it over our study period, house prices increased by 9.3% on average. Um, the, the, the fraction of investors in, increased by 4.2 percentage points during this time period. So if you multiply this coefficient by 4.2%, divide by 9.3, you get that basically the, 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 the effect, the, the economic significance of this is that investors sort of account for or help explain about 28% of the house price recovery um, up through 2014. If we change the investor definition to include individual investors, uh, we get uh, a little higher point estimate, but to be quite honest, uh, statistically speaking, these are no different because the confidence intervals overlap. Um, and the same can be said of adding cash buyers. If you want to think about just um, the marginal effect of increasing the share of homes purchased by the largest investors, the ones we're going to be hearing more about in the next two presentations, um, that, re that result, again, has the highest point estimate, but is not statistically different from our narrower definition of investors. So I'm going to conclude here, but there are a lot more results in the paper to share. And our main takeaways are that in institutional or corporate investors became much more active during, uh, during the crisis and the recovery period. And they appear to have helped speed up uh, the house price recovery significantly. And part of this, as we discuss in more depth in the paper, seems to be by reducing county vacancy rates. Interestingly, there really isn't any evidence in our paper that institutional investors led to higher rents or greater eviction rates for, a sample of, so for our sample of counties um, tracked through the recovery. But certainly, this is an area that warrants uh, continued research and monitoring, especially because, as George is going to explain, the, the, the market has really evolved since the recovery period. So thanks for letting me share this research with you. And, to, and I'm really excited to talk with anybody about public records data or the other data we use. Um, so please come see me after. Uh, we continue to refine this analysis, and we're really happy to share um, any new versions of the paper if you contact me. Thanks. Okay, yeah. Um, thanks, Laurie, for inviting me uh, to the Urban Institute for sharing my research. I'm Rohan Ganduri from Emory University. Uh, this research is a joint work with Stephen and Serena Shaw from UT Dallas. Uh, and what we'll see in this paper is, I'll, I'll hopefully you know, try and show you through our empirical analysis uh, and strategy that institutional investment has helped recover housing prices in the neighborhoods which are the most distressed neighborhoods during the foreclosure crisis. So uh, this is very similar in spirit to what Lauren just presented, but we are going to focus mainly on the large institutional investors, right? Um, so let me motivate this research by again recapping the, the, the recent 2007-2010 foreclosure crisis. And so during this crisis, we saw about 7.8 million homes that were foreclosed between 2007 and 2016. Uh, this foreclosure crisis peaked in 2011, where 1.6 million foreclosed homes, which, is, which accounted for 20% of all the foreclosed homes. That, that alone was in the year of uh, 2011. Now, this is a problem mainly for two reasons, right? So one, foreclosed homes tend to sell at discounted prices. So this depresses the prices of those foreclosed properties that are on the market. And two, there is a significant spillover effect of these foreclosed properties on the neighborhood uh, homes. And there's, a, there's extensive uh, work on this. And, and Lauren also has a paper showing how yeah, there's negative externalities that stem from these foreclosed properties on the neighboring homes. Right? At the, and, and now, to deal with these negative externalities and these, uh, these negative effects of foreclosures on the neighborhood house prices, 
there were several government initiatives, you know, ranging from the neighborhood stabilization program to the REO to rental, BPROs, HAMP, etc. At the same time, while this was happening, we also saw uh, some large institutional investors who were purchasing these foreclosed properties at deeply discounted rates, right? So unlike the government uh, where, who, who had the objective to stabilize the neighborhoods and, and you know, aid the housing price recovery, these institutional investors were purely acting out of the profit motive, which is they were hoping that they would buy these homes at deeply discounted prices and sell them once the house prices recovered, or they were buying them to rent them out and to sustain some sort of a cash flow business to the rents that they could get by renting these properties out. Um, if you take a look at the distribution of these homes over a period of time, uh, at the bottom you can see the growth rate for the entire US and uh, the growth rate for institutional home ownership for these, in these SFR uh, single family rental properties was different in different, different cities. Uh, and you can see the distribution over the map uh, right here. You see a lot more concentration in the, in the southwest region uh, of the US. But overall, between 2010 and 2018, the total holdings of uh, institutional investment in these uh, single family homes increased 34 and it is still growing. Right? And these large owners in, in uh, single family homes are now comparable to these large multifamily owners as well. Some of the largest players in this market are Blackstone, uh, American uh, Homes for Rent, Colony Starwood. So you can, as you can see, Blackstone owns about $12 billion under assets in uh, their management. So these are the homes that, value of the homes that they have uh, under their management. So the, the main research question that we have in this paper, that we study in this paper, is the effect of institutional investment on the local uh, real estate market. Uh, but we focus on institutional investment specifically in distressed homes, and we also focus during the foreclosure crisis period. So this is uh, between you know, 2010, 2007, 2000, uh, uh, to 2016. So the main research question is, how do institutional purchases of distressed homes affect neighborhood home prices, right? Now, just to give you a preview of results, uh, to tell you what we find, uh, we find that institutional investors were an important source of liquidity for distressed housing markets during this foreclosure crisis. The institutional purchases of distressed properties had, in fact, a positive spillover effect on the neighboring home values. Uh, homes that were within 0.25 miles, so this is about five blocks, from an institutionally purchased home was sold at $1.33 per square feet higher, or in terms of the total home value, this is about 1.4% uh, relative to the properties that were slightly further away. So that were between 0.25 miles and 0.5 miles. Now, these numbers might seem a little small to you, but I'll show you that this actually implies a 20% less underpricing of homes in especially some of those distressed areas, uh, in, in those areas where institutional investors are purchasing these, these distressed homes. Now, we also find when we look at the cross-sectional effects of, of institutional purchases, we find that this positive spillover effect was more stronger in, uh, for foreclosed transactions. That, that means the, the transactions that were foreclosed properties and that were being bought that are right next to these, these institutionally, uh, th that were bought by institutional investors, the effect was much greater for these foreclosed transactions. Uh, it was also greater for areas that had more distressed properties, that were, had more distressed housing markets. And I'll sh also show you that this effect of positive spillover effect was greater for properties that were very similar to the properties that were bought by these institutional investors. And some of these cross-sectional results are going to you know, help us uh, you know, dig down and, and you know, separate the, the, identify the channel through which this institutional investment affects the neighborhood property prices. All right, so ex ante, the effect of institutional purchases on neighboring homes is not that obvious, right? So it could have a positive effect or it could have a negative effect. So for example, the positive effect, which is what we sort of document in this paper can occur if uh, institutional purchases reduce the supply of homes in the neighborhood, right? So there is uh, fewer homes uh, that are available for, for purchase, and it's a pure you know, demand and supply uh, economics that would drive the, the price of these homes that are left over in the market. It could also be that once these institutional investors purchase these homes, 
they start renovating these homes, improving the quality of these homes, and that might have a positive spillover effect on the neighboring homes. On the other hand, you could also see a negative effect of institutional purchases on the, on the nearby homes. It could be that these institutional investors are trying to purchase these homes at, uh, at a bargain, right, at very deep discounts. And if there are other properties that are nearby that are trying to benchmark against these recently sold properties to institutional investors, then that might depress the prop, uh, prices of these neighboring homes. It could also be that there are other homeowners who do not want to live in areas. It's a matter of preference, but they may not want to live in areas that has a high percentage of homes that are rented out. Right? Or it could also be that given the technology that institutional investors have access to, they are able to purchase the, they are able to identify and purchase the good properties in a certain area. And so the ones that are left out are, you know, you have this lemons problem, there's this adverse selection issue where the ones that are left out are not of higher quality. And so maybe in that case, knowing this, uh, those properties will then tend to sell at a lower price to the other, uh, uh, to the other investors who want to purchase it. So ex ante, it's not obvious whether this effect is going to be positive or negative. Now, I know this is a data talk, so I just want to tell you the kind of data that we have in this analysis. Our primary data comes from uh, Zillow's Ztrax database. So this is, uh, a this is data that they make available to researchers, but I believe since uh, October of last year, they've stopped making uh, it available. They've, they've stopped giving out this data to new uh, projects. But until then, they were actually sharing this freely with anyone who would write a, a, a you know, proposal and Zillow would go with that proposal and then you know, uh, make this data available to researchers. Now this, this uh, Ztrax data consists of 400 million detailed public records uh, across about 2,700 counties. And it has 20 years worth of data uh, on transactions as well as uh, tax assessment data. Uh, so this will tell you whether uh, these transactions were foreclosure transactions or regular sales uh, or tax delinquencies or regular, you know, uh, you know auctions. It would, this data is also available for commercial as well as residential properties. Now there are two big data sets in the Ztrax uh, database. So one is the transactions data set and the other is the assessments data set. The transactions data set uh, tells you the identity of the buyer, the seller, and you know, fortunately for us, Zillow has its own uh, way to clean some of this data. So they provide you a clean version of the data. And in that case, they uh, identify which of these sellers and buyers were institutions or rather non-individuals and which were in individuals. So for us, you know, we just rely on the fact that we have a, per we have a buyer who is uh, not an individual and we follow a very similar procedure that uh, Lauren had outlined using uh, um, the mailing address of these buyers as well as the names of these buyers. But I'll come to that in a, in a little bit. Uh, so we, we, ma we actually manually identify uh, the owners based on their mailing addresses and their name. We again go back and do an internet search to see the different LLCs under which, for example, Blackstone has incorporated itself and makes these purchases, and we manually verify this. So this is, uh, you know, it, it takes a lot of manual work, it's painstaking, but you know, finally we were able to uh, you know, identify a lot of uh, institutional investors, 26 large institutional investors who had purchased about 166,000 uh, single family homes between 2010 and 2016. And uh, when we compare our data to Am the, the report by Amherst Capital, uh, we are able to identify about 88% of all the single family homes that were reported in this uh, Amherst Capital. So we are fairly confident about the algorithm that we had used to identify these institutional investors. Uh, this is the data that we have when we plot it. It gives you, a, a, you know, the familiar diagram that you see in Amherst Capital or even other papers that look at it, including Lawrence, to see where these institutional investors were essentially buying up these properties, right? So you can see a large concentration there in the, in the southwest area. And, uh, and the table right next to it tells you who are the biggest players. So Invitation, Invitation Homes, that's by uh, Blackstone, was uh, one of the biggest uh, players right there. American Home for Rent, the second one, Starwood Waypoint, the third one, and there's a merger between one and three uh, in 2017. So now they've become even larger. Now, uh, this is just a simple correlation plot between the house prices 
and in the institutional purchase. So house prices are on the y-axis and institutional purchases on the x-axis. And these are correlations that are plotted within the county. So inside a county, within a county, we are trying to look at how the house prices are correlated with institutional investments. Uh, and this, uh, this is capturing variation in the neighborhoods within a certain county. And as you can see, most of these institutional investors are buying up properties in areas that uh, had house prices that were trending down, right? So these were buying up properties in most of the distressed areas. But, uh, you know, uh, two years, three years, four years down the line, after their purchases, you see a, re you know, reversal in the trend of these house prices, where the house prices are in fact going up in these same neighborhoods that uh, the institutional investors had purchased these properties, right? This is using the entire data that we have. But of course, you might be worried that we are just picking up uh, some sort of a spurious correlation that, you know, the, the, there are important selection concerns that we need to address in this sort of an empirical exercise. One of the obvious selection concerns is that these institutional investors are smart, so they are probably purchasing these homes in areas uh, that they think will experience an increase in house price growth, right? So they've got all the models that, and all the technology that they have access to, and they can model those areas that would see a, a high house price growth in the future, and they're targeting only those homes. And what this means is that even without any institutional purchase, okay, if there was no institutional purchase in those areas, the house prices would have still trended upwards a couple of years after, uh, you know, a couple of years later. So it's not because of the institutional purchase that the house prices are going up. They would have gone up in spite of that, right? Uh, we try to deal with this selection effect that sort of favors our results. There's also a negative selection effect in those cases where the house prices were trending downwards and would have trended downwards irrespective of uh, the, the institutional purchase. But this is going to help us with our results. But the first case is a, is a big threat to our, uh, uh, to our results and our point estimates. We, we follow an empirical strategy, I think, that helps us get around this endogeneity uh, concern. Uh, we use a REO to rental pilot program that was instituted by the FHFA in 2012. Uh, the purpose of this program was to clear the national backlog of these REO foreclosed homes that uh, Fannie was, was, uh, had, a, had on its balance sheet. And the strategy was to prepackage some of these REO foreclosed properties in bulk and then just sell them to institutional investors, right? And this was an auction in which investors were bidding on these prepackaged pools of foreclosure properties. And there were some requirements. So the, one of the requirements was that they were, they were not allowed to sell, you know, they were not allowed to flip these homes over. So they were, they had to, they were required to rent these homes after they had purchased these homes. But importantly, one of the criteria that they had used in uh, making these uh, pools was that they were, they, the investors were not allowed to cherry pick individual properties in these pools, right? So these were pools that were prepackaged by Fannie and they were presented to the investors and the investors then just bid on, bid on the, these, these pools uh, of loans. So now this helps us with our identification because you might think that investors might be interested in a pool because of a larger geography. For example, let's say they expect a certain county to do well, but within that county, they're not cherry picking individual properties. And so essentially, we are trying to look at uh, what happens to the neighboring house prices that are about point, within 0.25 miles of one of these bulk sold properties. So the properties that, were, that was part of this prepackaged pool and we're comparing that with uh, properties that were slightly further away. Arguably, because they were not cherry picking these individual properties, these individual properties were you know, randomly or exogenously chosen, plausibly exogenously uh, chosen. And that helps with our identification uh, strategy in this case. So it's uh, the strategy here, the empirical setup is a difference in differences uh, setup in hyper local areas around these bulk sold properties. Uh, the treatment group are properties that are closer to these bulk sold properties and the control group of properties that are slightly farther away. And of course, the assumption in this sort of a setup is that uh, without, this, without, this institutionally, uh, th without this home that was purchased by institutional investors, the house prices that are closer to this bulk sold property and away from it would just trend parallelly or similarly. 
right? It's just that the, the assumption here is that the institutional purchase is actually causing the house prices closer to the bulk sold property to trend uh, the other way. So this is the, 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 the different diff equation that we have. Our transactions, the sample that we have in this case, are transactions within 0.5 miles uh, or, or radius of those bulk sold properties. Uh, we look at six months before, six months after, uh, and the bulk sale event was in June 2012. Uh, we also you know, do other kinds of robustness checks, which I will not go into in this case, but we look at one year later, one year before, one year after, and the results are still fine. And we have different uh, uh, distance cutoffs that we have in our, in our analysis as well. Uh, the price that we use in a, uh, as the dependent variable is, is a residual from a hedonic uh, regression of single family homes that are sold. You know, this hedonic regression we conduct for the entire uh, transactions that we see in the US market from, 2011 to 20, from 2010 to 2016. Um, and this dummy that you see, bulk sold, is, is equal to one for properties that are closer to these bulk sold properties, and it equals zero for properties that are farther away from, from those bulk sold properties. So to illustrate this empirical strategy, uh, you've got, uh, so here there's a figure of the Maricopa County in Arizona, and uh, these are different census tracts, and these, uh, the, you, you can see circles that are drawn, so the, the, the inner circle is a, point, a circle that is drawn with a 0.25 mile radius, and the outer circle is a 0.5 mile radius uh, circle. The, the points that you see at the center of these circles are the transactions that we're looking at. These are other transactions, not the bulk sold transactions. And what we're trying to say is that those black circles, which are the bulk sold properties, if that is close, if that is within 0.25 miles of the property that we're looking at right now, then the, then the property, the focal property, the central property would sell at a higher price uh, uh, than if it was away as you can see in the, in the case of the bottom circle. So in that case, the green triangle is the, is the control triangle, control property, because that's farther away. That's more than 0.25 miles away from the bulk sold property. Uh, this is, these are the three prepackaged pools that were auctioned off to investors. So there was Florida, there was West, and there was Chicago. Uh, in total, there were 1,700 properties. And one thing interesting to note from here is that if you look at the vacancy rate, uh, only 30% of them were vacant. So about 60%, 60 to 65% of all of these properties were in fact occupied. Um, and so they were being maintained to some extent. So you know uh, that's one of the reasons why, why, as I'll discuss later, this physical externality where homes get dilapidated and then that reduces the whole neighboring home values that may not exist as much in this case and you would you would you can, you're able to isolate the supply effect uh, a lot more as you, and as you can see some of these pools sold at a discount uh, the the first two sold at a discount and the last one in california sold at a premium in in this case this is the the main headline result that we have so homes that were uh, closer to the bulk sold properties, uh, sold at uh, $1.33 per square foot higher. Uh, if you actually take a look at how the neighboring home values were in this area before these purchases, most of these homes were trading at a discount, were selling at a discount of $6.52 per square foot. And so a $1.33 uh, increase per square foot uh, amounts to about 20% reduction in this underpricing of homes in those distressed uh, areas. Um, and these results were, are, are robust to controlling for other potential spillover effects. So at the same time, you would also see other investors that are purchasing homes in that same area. Uh, you would also see other foreclosures taking place in those same areas. So when we control for these, for these number of uh, other transactions, number of foreclosures, our results will go through. The point estimates are very similar. They don't change uh, very much. Uh, graphically, this is what the, the, these estimates will look like. So in the pre-period, as you would see, the house prices were on, uh, were on a decline. But once the, there was this bulk sale that took place, the neighboring house price transactions had an upward increasing trend. The left graph that you see here is, is where the control properties are between 0.25 and 0.5 miles. And the right graph is, is a larger set of control properties over one mile. And you can see that in both cases, the house prices were trending upwards right after the bulk sale. 
Um, we also find that these, this, this uh, spillover effect, the positive spillover effect of these institutional investment was higher for properties that were foreclosed. So these are, if the neighboring transaction that's taking place right now was a foreclosed property, then the spillover effect was higher. In fact, twice uh, as high. It was also more, uh, it was higher for illiquid distressed properties. So the longer a property was in foreclosure, uh, eventually when it sold, it sold at a greater price after the bulk sale event uh, compared to before the bulk sale event, you know, conditioning on the amount of, the same amount of uh, for, foreclosure time that it was, it was under uh, foreclosure. We also find that this effect was greater, this positive spillover effect was greater for properties that were very, uh, that was similar to those bulk sold properties, right? So we find that properties that had a similar size that were the same type, condo versus single family, uh, and um, were the same age, had a, uh, had a greater effect, spillover effect, uh, after this bulk sold properties were, 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 were sold. So this, this result basically suggests that what we are picking up here is probably a supply effect and not a disseminity effect. Because if it was a disseminity effect, a physical externality, then it really does not matter which properties uh, do you have close, closer to the bulk sale property. So if these properties were sold to institutional investors and they started renovating and fixing these properties uh, you know, as soon as they bought it, and if that led to an increase in the neighboring house prices, then it should not matter whether those neighboring house prices were similar to the bulk sold properties, right? So it, this effect would be the same for all kinds of properties. But the fact that we find that the homes that are more similar to the bulk sold properties see a greater increase in price, it suggests that this is more of a supply effect. So the kind of properties that uh, people are competing to buy, if there are fewer uh, of those properties because the institutions have already purchased some of them. There are fewer left on the market. The, uh, people are willing to pay a higher price to purchase those, those properties if they want to live in those, in those areas. We find a similar effect for uh, neighborhoods that are distressed. And what we do is we actually condition on the future house price growth. We look at neighborhoods that experienced a, a low house price growth. We take those neighborhoods and then we see we look at the hyper-local areas within those neighborhoods and see whether these uh, uh, bulk sale transactions had a positive spillover effect on, on the neighboring properties. And we find that the spillover effect is much greater in those, uh, in those distressed neighborhoods. In the last test, we want to compare what is the effect of a bulk sale versus any regular sale that might, that might happen in this case, right? Because the, the supply effect, uh, you know, you can, one can argue, should be similar for any regular transaction versus a bulk sale transaction. When we look at a regular transaction, uh, we find that this, this, uh, this spillover effect is not significant. And I think one of the reasons uh, we, we, we think this is the case is because when you have a bulk sale, you're able to pool some uh, properties that are not desirable per se, to investors who would have picked, who if you allow the investors to cherry pick those properties. So by pooling these properties and then selling them uh, in this prepackaged manner, you are able to sell some of those less desirable properties, which otherwise you would not have been able to sell. And I think that's causing the spillover, spillover effect to be stronger, especially for those distressed homes and those distressed uh, uh, neighborhoods. So just to conclude, uh, we find that institutional purchases of distressed properties have a positive spillover effect on the neighboring home values. Now, this positive spillover effect is greater for homes that are distressed, in neighborhoods that are distressed, and also for similar properties. And so this sort of points to a supply effect rather than this disseminity effect in our case. And the main takeaway from our analysis is that institutional investors were very important in, in providing liquidity uh, to these housing markets, especially when uh, you know, credit had dried up right after the financial crisis, and there were a lot of people who were evicted uh, uh, you know, from their homes, but there was demand for renting, and there's this huge backlog pro you know, inventory of homes that were on the foreclosure market. No one was uh, occupying them, and uh, investors, institutional investors came in, bought those properties, provided liquidity to the market, and helped meet the rental demand 
that that was pent up and uh, uh, because because the credit market is freezing at, at that point. Uh, I hope you enjoyed uh, the research. I'm again happy to talk about the details of the data and uh, the interpretation of the results uh, right after. I think George will will take over right after this. Thank you. Great. Uh, well, thank you, Rohan. Um, and thank you to Laura and the Urban Institute for having me uh, come to present today. Uh, I have about 15 or 20 minutes to discuss uh, Lauren and Rohan's papers and then provide an update uh, on the evolution of the SFR market. Uh, to begin, I'd like to thank Lauren and Rohan for their research. Uh, I spent about uh, half of my waking hours thinking about rental housing, uh, and I found their work on the, um, uh, you know, the, the SFR industry post-crisis really informative uh, and, and some interesting perspectives. After reading their papers, I, I came away with several questions and thoughts. Um, you know, first, are, are institutional investors large enough to impact the housing market in normal periods of time like we're in today, as well as distress periods, and, and, and trying to think through uh, the impact that large institutions have relative to smaller uh, investors and mom and pops uh, who made up the bulk and still do make up the bulk of um, of purchases in, in, in the market. Um, second, Lauren Rohan's research points to uh, the positive impact of pricing in 2009 through 2014. Uh, but is that still true today? And, and, and how does that differ between investors who do invest in, in, in the properties in the neighborhoods relative to those who, who do not invest? Uh, three, uh, how does uh, the impact of institutional investors change um, as an owner, sort of a, a long-term owner of these rental homes uh, in a market today, which as everyone here probably knows, has historically low inventory and, and uh, for sale housing. Um, it's obviously a part of a broader question around how to you know, spur more construction of, of housing in the US, especially entry-level housing in, in higher growth parts of the market. Uh, and lastly, you know, there's been a large shift in how institutional investors buy homes today versus 2009 through 14. Uh, certainly much less distress, uh, much few, uh, many fewer pools. Uh, we're much more focused today on identifying homes that are uh, the best rental properties in specific markets. You know, how, how will that impact pricing uh, going forward differently than it did in uh, the post-crisis period? I wanted to provide a quick overview of the SFR industry and the growth of institutional investors. Uh, Single-family rentals today are around 15 million units. Uh, it's just over 11 million detached homes and about 4 million attached homes. Uh, it's about 34% of all rental housing in the U.S. and about 12% of all housing. Uh, what I think is interesting is if you go back to 1970 or so, the last 50 years, single-family rentals have been about 33% of all rental housing and high 11% uh, of all housing. So certainly you can see the ratios increased from 2000 to 2005 uh, through the crisis period. Uh, and have sort of inched back uh, a bit, but are near their all-time um, average levels in terms of their uh, importance to the housing market. We, we do want to focus, though, on institutional investors. Uh, since 2012, the public REITs uh, and Peredium have acquired around 180,000 homes, uh, adding some of our larger private peers. We think the number is closer to 250,000 in total. Um, so we remain a small part of the SFR industry. Uh, the table in the top right is from Freddie, uh, from a survey they did about a year ago. Uh, they show institutional owners being about 1% of the overall market. You know, uh, estimates range from, from 1% to 2%. What, what I think is interesting is uh, compare that to the bottom right-hand chart, uh, where you can see there was about 4 million single-family rental homes were added between 2005 and 6 uh, and 2016. Again, of that 4 million homes, institutions bought, you know, between two and 300,000. Most of the inventory was acquired by um, small investors uh, and, and, and individuals. I wanted to compare and contrast the portfolios of some of the institutional investors uh, with the broader market. Uh, our firm and, and, and many of our peers provide high-quality rental homes in good neighborhoods uh, to residents who are unable to or choose not to uh, uh, purchase that home. Uh, we acquire homes that tend to be newer than the market average for rental homes. 
That's the right-hand chart from uh, the Harbor JCHS. You can see only about 35% of all SFR in this country were built uh, after 1980. Uh, the four largest owners, uh, their average home is around 20 years old. Um, when we acquire homes, um, we tend to invest around $20,000 into that house, primarily in HVAC and roofs, flooring, and kitchens and baths. Um, these are improvements uh, which a first-time home buyer may not be able to afford uh, and which we believe uh, improves the resident's experience, the neighborhood, and, and does also lower our annual maintenance costs. Lori asked me to discuss some of the benefits and challenges of increasing institutional ownership within the SFR market. Um, as we just discussed, we believe that institutional owners provide a higher quality rental home uh, than the market average both in terms of quality uh, of home and service. Uh, we discussed earlier the, the capital investment uh, that we make uh, in each home at the time of purchase. Uh, our trade group, the NRHC, uh, you can see on average uh, spends around $21,000 per home when, when, when we and our peers acquire homes. Um, in terms of service, uh, at Predium we have around 1,100 employees who are focused on single family rentals, uh, primarily in customer facing roles and, and service focused. Uh, we have over 250 fleet vehicles that drive around our markets, uh, which we believe improves the efficiency of our service tax uh, and allows us to respond to residents in a more timely manner. Um, we and our peers are responsible for maintaining our homes in good condition uh, and responding to resident issues as they arise. Uh, it's a responsibility that we take very seriously. Along with this responsibility, we're, we're also, as Rohan uh, discussed, uh, a profit-seeking firm. We have a fiduciary duty to our investors uh, to provide returns on their capital. Um, one of the issues that uh, Lori asked me to discuss was, was rental rates and, and rent burdens, which is certainly topical given the recent uh, Harvard JCHS uh, report on rental housing. Uh, you know, we, we strive to, uh, you know, we, we do increase rents on our homes, but we, 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 you know, we strive to have a fair rent increase in order to maximize occupancy and, and, and revenue for our investors. If you look at the top four owners of single family rental, us and three of the large public companies, uh, we're almost 96% occupied in our homes, uh, which I believe speaks to our homes being fairly priced at the fair market rent. Lastly, we're also active in the transaction market, uh, which is Lauren and Rohan's research illustrates, can have an impact on market pricing, uh, especially in an environment of, of low supply uh, and fewer entry-level homes. With the remaining time, I wanted to discuss some of the uh, changes in the institutional SFR market. Um, you can see in 2012 through 2014, uh, institutional SFR grew quickly as firms bought pools of homes through auction foreclosure and bulk sales. Uh, you can see that the buying was, was pretty rapid. Uh, nearly 150,000 homes were acquired by institutions. Uh, in those three years. Um, as we fast forward to today, I'd say more of the buying is done one at a time than, than through pools or, or foreclosures. Uh, I think we and our peers have found uh, better outcomes um, and, and sort of better rental homes by acquiring, uh, underwriting, and inspecting each home individually. Thinking through the, uh, the market concentration of institutional owners, Lauren discussed this uh, earlier. Uh, this is an analysis by, by Freddie Mac. Uh, you can see on the left-hand side, SFR in this country is pretty proportionate to, to population uh, across the MSAs. Uh, but on the right-hand side, you can see that the, the institutional owners have tended to own uh, in fewer markets, um, primarily in the higher growth uh, Sunbelt markets, which um, uh, with, as Lauren mentioned, um, you know, many of the Midwestern markets as well. When we think about the magnitude and the impact of, of, of our buying on markets, uh, we estimate that the four largest owners of single-family rentals uh, who own 180,000 homes nationally, these are the, the markets where, uh, that we're sort of focused on, um, they own about 5% of the single-family rental homes in these markets uh, and about 1% of all single-family housing uh, again, in these markets. Lastly, for me, just, just thinking about why we acquire where we acquire, 
um, our capital allocation, and I assume uh, the, the same is for our, our, our large peers as well. Um, it's shaped by top-down research and market views, uh, coupled with bottoms-up analytics, uh, which, which is based on the operating performance of our home. Like we're, we're, we're trying to acquire homes that will experience strong rental demand uh, and, and provide strong cash flows for our investors. Uh, this has historically been uh, in higher growth Sunbelt markets. Um, you know, generally with newer, uh, newer housing stock and already a, a high percentage of, uh, of households who rent single family homes. Uh, when I think about our 15 markets, uh, on average about one in five detached single family homes is a rental. So it's already part of the housing culture in, in these markets. This is it for me. Just, uh, you know, as we think about, you know, within markets, uh, you know, we and others are also, uh, you know, focused on certain submarkets uh, that we expect will, will produce, um, you know, both high quality rental homes and stronger growth than, than the market average. So with that, I'll invite everyone back to the stage. Thank you very much, everyone, for three really great presentations. I really appreciate it. That was just a great job. Um, what I'd like to do is actually um, start with questions from the audience. And if you don't have any, I'll substitute mine. But I'd rather take audience questions first. Uh, yes, um, Paul. Oh, sorry. So I don't know if this is a question or a comment. But uh, yeah. so for the, the, um, the story around the bulk, Sales being a supply effect, um, I think there. You know, why why would there be a supply effect? What is it about the program that generated supply, right? As opposed, you know, that wouldn't have been there. So uh, I, that's the question. And then the comment is, I think I'll answer, I'll, I'll provide my own answer or speculation. <laughs> right? Okay, so. Um, it could it could be more of an information effect. So you have a you have some markets for whatever reason that are moving and some markets not moving. The supply will tend to flow to where it's already moving because there's more information about what these properties are worth. So by for by kind of the program basically worked against that. You didn't get a choice of where to buy. You, so you, you got more information uh, than going to areas that might not have had the sales for whatever reason. So I don't know, that, that's one answer to that question. But generally, I think, you know, I think the supply effect needs to be a little more explained, I think. Sure. So yeah. you want me to? Yes, yeah. please. So uh, thanks, Paul, uh, Paul for, the, for the comment. Um, so you're right. I mean, we were thinking about this, uh, you know, really we tried to think very carefully. And again, in this paper, we we are saying that this suggests more of a supply effect rather than a disseminity effect. And for a couple of reasons, I think even the information story, um, you know, I would think that that is more prep, you know, that would be more first order if the institutional investors were, were able to cherry pick these properties. Because, you know, the fact that they are willing to invest in a certain area provide some sort of uh, uh, revealed information to other investors that, you know, let's say um, Invitation Homes is willing to invest in this area. Maybe the outcomes and the trends in these markets are on a, on a positive trend. So things might improve very quickly, and that might draw in other people. I think one of the, one of the things that helps with our identification, at least, is that all these properties were prepackaged, and the investors were not allowed to cherry pick. So, it, to, to us, it seemed like that would go against some of these uh, certification or, or uh, information effects. And uh, and again, for the for the disseminity effect that can still uh, be there, 
In our case, we are not taking a very strong stance on it. One of the reasons is that 60% of these properties were already occupied. So to some extent, they were already being maintained by the people who are living in it. Uh, and so, in fact, taking a step back, the way we look at it is that in generally in most of these kinds of exercises, you have both these effects and it's very hard to tease them out. But in this case, the disamenity effect, I think, we, we believe will be, a, a, you know, will be less of a concern because it was already being maintained by the people who are living in it. And so maybe what comes out of it is the, is the supply effect. And we are, we are, we, we, at this point, we've got like one or two tests on that, which is uh, the, the fact that it affects, uh, the, the, the effects are greater for properties that are more similar to the bulk sold properties rather than uh, physically closer. And it seemed like that, that fit more with the supply narrative. Uh, but I'm again happy to hear uh, any more. Sure, sure. Yeah, and we are, we are, we are sure. Yeah, yeah. Can Certainly. I actually ask you a follow-up question? Yeah. I was actually surprised that 60% of the properties were were rented. Um, just the, um, rental having a property rented, you know, when you're part of a distress program, does not necessarily equal having the tenant paying rent. Yeah. Were you able to differentiate whether the property, whether the tenant was paying rent, and did you actually try to, were you able to know which properties were rented and which were not, and were you able to use that in your identification? No, I think anyway? that would have been great, right? So if we had, uh, if we had every property, we don't even know which property uh, was occupied and which was not, right. let alone whether the occupied properties were if the, if the people were paying rent okay. on, on time. I assume that because you didn't use it, but I was, I was, I was yeah, just wondering. Yeah, yeah, that's one of the reasons that we had, because some of this data was publicly available on uh, Fannie Mae's website, and we're trying to see if we can get some more data on, on this, because the, such granular information can help us really, you know, tease out the, the real channel for, for this effect. But most of these properties, as I understand it based on my reading, is these were second homes for a lot of individual investors, and when those people defaulted on their mortgages, uh, that's when they wanted, uh, you know, th that's when those went into foreclosure and they wanted to evict the people, the renters who were living in those uh, properties. But Fannie decided to keep them in and uh, convert this into a REO to rental program directly. So that doesn't increase the eviction rates and all those kinds of things. Um, in the back. Indicators. The question was, how do you how did you define the hedonic indicators when you have such dissimilar properties? Uh, similar property. So the the hedonic regression, yeah, the hedonic regression was run um, at a zip code level. Uh, so within the zip code, we ran a hedonic regression. So basically, it was a, a you know based on some of the past literature that we followed, the number of uh, bathrooms, the number of uh, bedrooms. Um, and um, yeah, all the property characteristics that we had access to. And this was a little bit, it was a little bit challenging because uh, the public records in some areas had good coverage on the number of bathrooms and in some cases it was missing. And to deal with some of those, we had to run different hedonic regressions for different, uh, you know, different uh, local regions. And given that we were making these comparisons in, in a very small micro local region, so we thought any, uh, you know, as long as this error was not systematic, the, the, the error in, in specifying this hedonic model was not systematic, it would get washed out in the difference and difference framework. And the question also is the distress properties, yes. you know, because that, how, you can't control for that very easily. Oh, yeah, no, that, that, that's why. So we are running this on all regular transactions and all regular properties. And if you actually take a look at the residuals, what is remaining, uh, if you take a look at the mean residuals for those distressed properties, uh, it tells you that they're distressed because the residuals are negative, yeah. right? So it tells you that relative to an average home, they're actually selling at a lower price. And so that sort of made sense, uh, that gave us a little more confidence in our hedonic regression model. So I'm going to actually exercise the moderator's um, prerogative and ask a question. And actually, this one is more geared toward um, Lauren and um, George. And um, Lauren, you found actually a big effect on the home ownership rate. Um, and um, George, you had actually mentioned you had actually mentioned in your written materials, but didn't actually say that you know in low periods of home inventory, the impact may be more significant. And I was just sort of wondering how you tease out. Um, 
sort of the impact of tight credit, the sort of the post-crisis very tight credit availability that we've experienced from the effect of what is institutional in, um, investor home ownership? What is institutional investor buying? Sure. Um, so, so I guess, you know, I, I'm not sure that we as a, for, for the large institutional owners have, are able to impact home ownership. Um, I, I think, you know, we, we tend to own homes and, and I'll, I'll speak for ourselves, but I think our larger peers as well, you know, we, we try to locate our homes in, in, in good neighborhoods with good schools, which also have higher home ownership rates. Um, you know, we're, we're trying to maximize our demand for that, for that house, and we think we do it by appealing to a, a really wide uh, customer base, both young families with children in school, um, older adults who may not have kids in school but want to live in a nice neighborhood, and or just young people who don't really have a third option for, for multifamily uh, in, in these suburban markets. Um, so I, I think we're trying to offer a, again, a high quality housing option um, in markets that already have a deep sort of pool of single family renters. Um, I'm not sure we own enough of the housing stock to impact home ownership. And I'd say that since we're focusing on the crisis, something that I didn't really get into in my presentation, but um, you know, a lot of these investors, as I did mention, are were buying properties out of foreclosure, and that can really happen at two points in the process, right? When a property goes to foreclosure auction, which is when the, the, the mortgage borrower really loses title of the property and the foreclosure really happens at that moment, right? When the property goes to the foreclosure auction, the property can be bid on by investors or prospective homeowners. And uh, in graduate school, uh, I started attending foreclosure auctions as it was part of a qualitative methods class requirement. But I, um, <laughs> but, and I thought, oh, I have to do this. But it ended up being one of the most interesting things I did as a PhD student uh, was attending these auctions in Massachusetts to see how these worked and to try to get a sense of, you know, who, who does buy properties at foreclosure auction? Because, you know, you, you would buy a property sight unseen. You would need to come up with the cash to close within about 30 days or else forfeit a ten to $15,000 earnest money deposit. And what I quickly learned is that not a lot of prospective homeowners show up at foreclosure auctions, and those who did were pretty bewildered right away when learning um, what they were up against, right? They, that's a lot of risk to buy a house at foreclosure auction. And a lot of homes um, end up going into um, REO because nobody bids a sufficient amount at the foreclosure auction. I think in Massachusetts, when I was studying it, about 80% of the properties were ultimately going to REO. There, homeowners stand a better chance, right, because you, it's easier to buy a home with a mortgage when you're buying out of REO. You can go in, you can inspect it. It's on the MLS, right, you get photos. It's, it's uh, much more accessible, and yet still, you would see a much larger share of those properties going to investors. And um, after interviewing a lot of investors and prospective homeowners as a graduate student, um, this is really going back to my dissertation <laughs> days here, so thanks for bringing me back, Lori. Um, it, um, it, it, it was really interesting to me how often the investors were really the only ones who could take on the magnitude of a distressed property. And this was Boston. This wasn't even some of the markets where the properties were in much worse disrepair. So I think that, you know, we, we realized that, that, you know, that it's a constant balance, right? You want to be able to have people have access to, um, to first time home buyer opportunities. You want to get people into those environments, but you also recognize that sometimes some properties just aren't cut out for the typical homeowner. And so the, in that way, the investors, um, to sort of argue against um, <laughs> your, your interpretation, that you know, the investors could really stabilize those, those neighborhoods by taking on those distressed properties. And Lori, I guess my comment on, um, sorry, my, my comment on um, the impact today in a more normal or tight housing market versus 2010, 11, 12. As you know, the, the amount of homes for sale, new and existing, was 35 to 4% of all inventory back in 2011. And today it's 1.3. And the long term average is like 2.5. So just to the extent that people are buying homes, I think there was a stabilizing effect back in 2009 through 14. 
Whereas today, you know, just given the, the tightness of homes, uh, there might be more competition for the same home. Thank you. I think there's a question in the back of the gentleman in the blue shirt. Um, two of you put up slides that showed where all the uh, rental houses are versus institutionally owned. What's the difference? Why do some cities institutionals not buy in? And specifically, are there any state or local laws that sort of um, discourage institutional investors? Yeah, so, so the analysis of, uh, was from Freddie Mac, at least the one that I, I showed. Uh, Lauren did, did work as well. Um, there are some local laws that, that disincentivize. Some, some states have different tax, uh, tax rates for investors versus, versus owners. Um, and I'd say just overall, if you look at the markets that, that institutions are not in, uh, they tend to be some of the higher property tax states um, because the rental yields after factoring in property tax, uh, you're unable to generate as high as a, of a return. George, would you, would you also say that part of it is the, um, the rent to price ratio just being lower in mm -hmm. some of those places like, like Boston, for example, mm -hmm. right? You don't see a lot of institutional investors there because the, the profit, the entry price is so high and the, and also potentially the housing stock being older and not necessarily yeah. as suitable mm -hmm. for a large scale operation. Yeah, that's fair. And I, I guess third is just, just general demographics. I think a lot of investors, you know, move toward, towards where there's just generally better immigration and, and employment growth. And some of those markets are obviously, you know, suffering from, from out migration and lower growth. Um, I think Julia had a question in the front, and then there's a gentleman, and then Andrew. But Hi, uh, Julia Gordon, National Community Stabilization Trust. Thank you so much for this awesome panel. Um, it, as Lori knows, it's one of my favorite topics. And I have a question, but first I have to make a comment because Lauren, I, I just want to underscore that what you talked about in terms of the experience you had some years ago at foreclosure auctions and with REO purchases has um, is now much uh, further down the road to being um, family unfriendly, let's call it, or you know, mortgage using homeowner, home buyer unfriendly. Not only have many of those foreclosure auctions that you went to now moved online, um, but REO, with the exception of Fannie and Freddie and FHA, no REO se sellers have a you know a few REO sellers have a first look for home buyers, and the the uh, the a lot of the purchases we see are increasingly upstream from that. So, you know, a lot of those, again, are sold on auction sites which have the same characteristics as the foreclosure auctions you saw in that they require cash deposits, they often specify no conventional financing, et cetera, et cetera. Um, plus, you know, folks are buying upstream. They're buying the notes. In the case of FHA, they're buying through the claim without conveyance of title process, which no homeowner can really access. So that's... That's something that's really worth looking at going forward. But the question I wanted to ask has a lot of counterfactuals embedded in it, which is, had you taken, um, what, you know, 190,000 or, you know, 1,600 homeowners, individual families, given them a mortgage for any price, removed the appraisal process, and said, go, and given them the exact access to these houses, would you have had the same price effect? So, yeah, I think that, at least in my case, so that's a, that's a very good question. And if you, if you truly believe, let's say, the, the supply effect, it really shouldn't matter who purchases this, uh, these homes, whether the institutions purchase it or whether the individual investors purchase it. So from that point, uh, it should have, you should have the same effect. If you just randomly just, you know, give them the same properties to buy, uh, but uh, you should have the same effect. But the point, at least during that time, was that credit was not available to some of these, uh, you know, individual investors to go and purchase these properties. And the argument that we are trying to make is that the people who had the money and who could execute these deals at such a large scale were only these institutional investors. And the, and the second thing as well is that 
if you are also, it's not very clear to me as well, because if you're, and I don't know, maybe George can talk about this uh, in, in greater detail. Um, if these large institutions are also cherry picking properties, right, it leaves a you know, lower quality pool for the rest of the uh, individual investors. So it's not very clear whether when you just look at these transactions that these large institution investors are picking up, whether that would have a negative effect on some of the remaining properties or not. But yeah, there's, I mean, there's a follow-up study for you to do specifically on the pool you looked at, which is we know from discovery during litigation against some of the investors who purchased through the REO to rental program uh -huh. that many of those lower value properties were sold in land contract or rent to own um, transactions. And so I would be curious if that price effect held up or started to erode I see. because of the subsequent effects. But I'm curious, just your answer, Lauren, to my question. Um, I, I agree with Ron what he's saying. And I mean, I think that when we look at the NSP program, right, I mean, that was not in the end a very large scale program in terms of getting homeowner stabilized neighborhoods, but that was one of the main ways that some of the funding was used by certain cities was to work with nonprofits to find home buyers who could, you know, take over some of these foreclosed properties. And, um, and I think what limited evaluations we've seen have been very positive about the NSP program. And, and um, unfortunately, we're never going to know because during the crisis, as you mentioned, mortgage credit was tight, unemployment was up. Um, any kind of wealth that people had for down, down payments had been eroded. Um, and so, you know, I think that in, in some sense it was fortunate that there was a group of people who could take on the properties, and yet you do worry about, you know, well, is this something that's magical about an investor, or is it just that that's, that's the group that had the, the, the resources at the time to, to take on the property so that we wouldn't have as long time, time on market? We will certainly offer our database of the 27,000 properties that have been acquired through nonprofit mm -hmm. developers and rehabbed over that period of time if you guys want to stick those into your formulas. Sure, Absolutely. we'd love to. Yeah, we'd <laughs> love to. So, um, Andrew, who's sitting right next to Cheryl in the back. Hi, uh, Andrew Jakobovics. Um, sort of a follow up on some of the data questions, but really also just wondering for, for Ron. Um, so on the data side, just wondering for you, Lori, um, did you guys do any sort of other data cleaning and sort of linking into administrative databases beyond what was in the core logic in terms of like Secretary of State data and things like that to identify um, kind of beneficial owners of um, some of the LLCs and things like that? So that's question one and then for Ron. Um, and George, it'd be great to get your sense also in terms of, to the extent that investors have very, very similar buy boxes. Um, in terms of sort of common age, quality, right, a lot easier to buy, whether it's in bulk or one at a time, you know, properties all of relatively the same vintage, either in master plan communities or sort of relatively new uh, in certain sub-markets within counties. Um, just wanted to know sort of how you address some of that potential endogeneity in terms of the dispersion of age of properties and things like that that might be uh, skewing some of the kind of commonality around the issue of sort of, we see sort of a similarity effect of whether so, how you sort of captured some of that in the kind of underlying data. Sure. Uh, you want to go first? Or? Um, so, yeah. Go ahead. Sure. Uh, yeah, no, that's a, that's a good question. I think that's where some of the hedonic regressions that we do, I think, uh, come into play because uh, we are also we can also control for uh, the 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 different preferences that people have for a two bedroom apartment in different areas, right? So, you know, in a place where people prefer two bedrooms over uh, you know three bedrooms. Those are the places where two bedrooms or homes will be priced higher. And that's why when we run these hedonic regressions within these zip code areas, we are sort of controlling for uh, the, the preference for e each of these different uh, characteristics of these properties. And we are trying to remove that, strip away all these effects from uh, property prices, and then look at what the residual does after that. That's how we try to do it. But that's a great question, yeah. 
And on um, the, the corporate databases that are available through states, as the Secretary of State, these, this is an incredible resource that if you're doing this type of research, you want to know about. So for this particular project, because we were doing a nationwide study, we did not do that exercise. But for an earlier project um, using data on Boston, I did, where every single foreclosed property in Boston over a 15-year period, I looked to, to, um, up every single buyer in the corporate database. Massachusetts is really wonderful because you don't hit a paywall and you can find articles of incorporation and find exactly who every LLC is. Mm -hmm. A lot of other states you very quickly hit a paywall and you just can't get there. But um, it's a fantastic resource if you're working with public records data and you want to say, well, who is 123 Green Street LLC? Um, we have time for one last question. I, or, or are we at time? We're at, cut, it, cut it. Okay. So thank you all very much for coming. I'd like to, you know, thanks for all of you who came in person, all of you who joined in on the webcast, and a special thanks to our presenters. You all were fabulous. Again, our next data talk is April 21st. It's featuring Sam Cater, um, the chief economist at Freddie Mac, who's going to discuss filtering and the effect of affordable housing, um, and also um, and share some uni unique insights, also using property records data. Um, Check us out on www.urban.org slash events, and you'll find all the information on that program, and you should all be on our distribution list. And if you're not, let us know. Thank you. So again, thank you all for coming, and a special thanks to our presenters. Thank you.